thanks for the kind invitation and uh, the introduction. So um, yes, so today I want to present you our work that we recently did on lead halide perovskite nanocrystals. And the motivation for our work actually comes from this curve that you see here. So what you see here is the trend curve for microprocessors, uh, some key metrics there. So you see, for example, with the uh, orange triangles, this is the number of transistors that has been uh, doubling every uh, two, two years over the last five decades or so. And this is the so-called Moore's law. So this is still holding up even in 2020. But what you see here also in this curve is that actually some of the curves, they, they flattened out much earlier. So for example, when you look at the clock frequency here, it started to level off in about 2005 at about five gigahertz. So this means the clock frequency of processes did not increase uh, really since 2005, since, since 15 years. And the reason for this is uh, um, the breakdown of the so-called Dennard scaling, which in a hand-waving way meant when you make the transistor smaller, you can make them at the same time faster within the same power envelope. And this is not true anymore since about 2005. So this is why we are also looking uh, if there might be a paradigm change uh, around there. And if there's opportunity to really revisit uh, all optical devices. I mean, uh, there was this provocative article from David Miller in 2010, Nature Photonics, are optical transistors the next logical step? But of course, we all know that there's a fundamental challenge behind this, why we don't have these optical transistors uh, now for even after many uh, decades of research. And the reason for this is that you always need a piece of matter to mediate the interaction between light beams. So, and there the, the crucial uh, point is that the optical nonlinearity in materials is generally very weak. So this means you require large bulky crystals and high optical drive power. An important realization there one has to make is that for this really to be optimized or to be enhanced, the strength of the light matter interaction in the end is pivotal because all the interaction has to go via the metal part here. If successful to build an optical transistor, one can think about what would be the, the fundamental limits that are there. So if you, for example, it would be possible to use a single photon to uh, operate a transistor. This would mean about 100 times less energy than a current CMOS transistor. And if you would be able to use terahertz speed, this would correspond to about 100x speed up. A downside that many critics, uh, critics always bring is that uh, with optics, you never will get the density. Yes, that's completely right. I think in the end, you will be limited by the optical wavelength, maybe to, to micrometer sized devices. If you go to plasmonics, you can make it smaller, but then you have losses. But still, I think density, you will never reach the level of electronics. But uh, for many applications, actually, the density is not really an issue but speed is king. So if you would solve the other two things about the energy efficiency and the speed, this would be enough uh, more or less to, to motivate this, um, this, this kind of approach. So what we are doing in, in Zurich really, we are, uh, we are exploring the future of light-based computing technologies. And we do this uh, to, uh, by looking uh, after new materials and also after new photonic structures that we can realize and in the end, of course, we want to build a scalable technology platform that would be able to realize all optical, uh, all optical logic gates at terahertz speed and with sub attojoule energy. So uh, the approach that we're using, of course, being the Polaritronics seminar, you, you know very well. So is, we want to do this via the strong light matter interaction regime where the coupling between photons in a cavity uh, dominates over the losses from the cavity. But actually, I was asked not to present about our polariton stuff, but more about the materials uh, side of, of this uh, thing here. So we, I will not discuss any cavities anymore. This is the only picture of a cavity in my whole talk today. But I will talk about the material aspects. What are uh, novel materials that might be suitable to embed there, which have this uniquely strong light matter interaction? And um, 
there we have our team at Zurich. We are specialized in doing spectroscopy, but actually the materials that you will see today, they're all synthesized by Kovalenko Group at ETH Zurich and, and EMPA, where we have a very close collaboration. So we have uh, more or less like a steady exchange of materials and, and the results between this, these two groups there. And all the materials are synthesized there that you will see. So the material system that we're looking at is uh, a colloidal lead halide nanocrystals. So on the left, you see the crystal structure from the perovskite material, which contains cesium as the uh, center atom. And then you have the, this lead octahedra around there and the halide atoms that are around. And the halide we use, for example, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Uh, so our favorite actually is chlorine and bromine, uh, which uh, we are using. So in my talk today, I will focus on, on this. The advantage of these materials is that it's in principle, it's a quite simple synthesis and uh, you get a highly monodispersed uh, nanocrystals out. You can use the spectral tunability either through the composition that you change, for example, the halide or you change the, the center uh, there. And uh, of course, being quantum dots, you can also change the size and thereby tune the wavelength. Excellent feature of these quantum dots is actually that they have uh, a very high quantum yield at room temperature, even without any passivation shell. So uh, for example, if you compare to cadmium selenide quantum dot, you always need these passivating shells also to get high quantum yield. For this perovskite, you don't need. So um, what makes them a nice uh, material system to, to do uh, photonics with. So uh, if you look really on this on the level of single quantum dots there, you see that at a low temperature, they have got very narrow emission lines. So small, uh, narrow than one milli electron volt. If you look over time, you see that they've uh, got very low spectral diffusion, at least on a slow time scale. For example, if you would compare to cadmium selenide, they would be dancing all over the, the place there and almost no blinking. So more or less they're, they're steadily on if you uh, uh, have, to, let's say, the, the right chemistry in place. Another thing which is very important for the stuff that I will tell you today is that they have a very small inhomogeneous spread. So if you look really more or less how far the, diff the energy differ uh, from each other, if you have an ensemble of quantum dots, it's actually very narrow compared to any other quantum dots. Uh, it's only about 15 to 20 milli electron volt. And this is actually due to the uh, intermediate confinement regime where they are in. So these quantum dots, they're relatively large. Uh, they're about 10 to 50 nanometers uh, approximately. And there the Bohr uh, diameter from, from the exciton is typically on the order of seven, eight nanometers. So this is actually a little bit smaller than the quantum dots. So they don't feel so much the confinement. So this means if you have a small size dispersion, it actually doesn't matter so much by changing the wavelength. And then, of course, what you want to see also, if you have got uh, want to do some, some quantum optics uh, experiments, that you see photon anti-bunching. And this is actually also observed. Here, this differs between room temperature, where you see actually very little uh, uh, peak, uh, anti-bunching peak, uh, residual anti-bunching peak at, at zero time, where more or less the, all the bi-excitons are quenched much more effectively in the low temperature you start to, to see some uh, zero time coincidence counts. Nevertheless, you, you can prove that it's anti-bunching, so you're really proving that it's a quantum uh, two-level system. What makes them so special, these, these materials, <clears throat> is that um, they have extremely fast radiative decay. So if you look here uh, on um, these curves, is for several compounds is that they have a radiative decay below one nanosecond. So for example, if you would compare with organics, they have typically several nanoseconds at, at low temperature if, if they have 100% quantum yield. But these materials now, they can go much below um, a nanosecond there. And this is purely radiative and beautifully a single exponential decay. And another important ingredient, of course, is that they have very long coherence time. So there, this you can find out, for example, doing four-wave mixing experiments. And there you find that uh, the T2 time is actually in the order of tens of picoseconds. So some other groups, this is a result from us with four-wave mixing. Some other groups doing single dot spectroscopy have found up times up to 70, 80 picoseconds there. So they have extremely long T2 time. So taking this nice single quantum dots that I just show you, I showed you and uh, making the next step more or less, looking not at the single quantum dots, but assembling many of them 
into uh, so-called super lattice. So more or less you make crystal out of nanocrystals. And how you do is you let uh, the solution of nanocrystals, the crystals slowly dry. And thereby, if you, if you get the conditions right, they assemble nicely into super cubes. And these super cubes, they reach dimension up to several micrometer size. Actually, when you look at them, at them with the transmission electron microscopy, uh, you see that there are still individual uh, nanocrystals inside there. But in the end, of course, they're not perfectly cuboidal. Also, it, it's amazing that they actually in, inherit the symmetry of the individual constituents, these individual nanocrystals, but they're uh, not perfectly cubic, but they have a cuboidal shape that is realized in these assemblies. So what are the properties of this? You can go back to the 1950s and think what happens when you do when you put many emitters in a very small volume that is smaller than the optical wavelength. And then uh, Dickey uh, called this phenomenon um, that can occur there because of coherence between these, these dipoles, super radiance. And uh, what this effect uh, results in is that these dipoles, they can actually couple coherently through the vacuum modes of the electromagnetic field and thereby their overall light matter interaction is enhanced by the factor of uh, the number of uh, dipoles that are actually coupled. So there's, a, of course, a classical analog on how you can easily understand this. This is uh, with this um, coupled oscillators here, which are metronomes, these, these dipoles. And what you see here is actually uh, exactly what happens in our samples in a more classical example. So first, we excite the individual uh, emitters. They're incoherent. And then if you provide them with a coupling, which is in our case coupling via the uh, vacuum modes of the electromagnetic field, they synchronize over time. And now they more or less act as one single giant dipole. So they have like the oscillator strength of a giant dipole, and this dipole is, is decaying much faster. Actually, the movie goes on, and then you, you will see that when you remove the coupling, they will lose uh, the synchronicity. But uh, the reasons why actually the superfluorescence has been quite rare in the past is that it's not so easy to realize it because you have to fulfill several conditions. So people found it, for example, in dense HF, dense, dense HF gases or in two O2 color centers in KCL or in some uh, conjugate polymer. So sorry, I will just stop this. So why is the superfluorescence only observed in such few systems? And uh, the reason is that the requirements are really stringent. So we have to have a high uniformity of emitters. So this means you cannot have much dispersion in, in the wavelengths that they have. They have to have a very high oscillator strength in order to couple via the electromagnetic field. And then on top of this, you have to have a long exciton dephasing time or less that gives them enough time to really synchronize their, their phases. <clears throat> so just to, to set things clear, what's the difference between super radiance and super fluorescence? So in Dickey super radiance, the, uh, you excite a system and then more or less you, you excite it in a coherent way. So when the uh, two level systems, they are excited, they're already in a coherent state. And then this leads, leads to the uh, emission of the super radiant pulse, which you, uh, where you have this, this gain of effect of N in the decay rate. And also uh, you see that the peak intensity here scales with the number of uh, emitters coupled squared. For superfluorescence, <clears throat> this is closely related uh, to super radiance, but there's a little bit different. So and this is the experiment that we are doing. We are exciting the dipoles, the, our nanocrystals. First, they are incoherent. Then after some time, they couple through the uh, electromagnetic vacuum modes and then they become coherent. This takes some time until this occurs. And only then they uh, emit the super radiant burst of light. So in the end, the signal, what you uh, get from these, these systems is, it looks like this, where you have a delay time. And then actually so you have some oscillations, which are like Rabi type oscillations, so-called Burnham Chow uh, ringing in the system. So how does this look like in, in the super lattice that uh, we are investigating here? For comparison, you see the emission spectrum of a glassy quantum dot uh, film. So this is like the luminescence from this constituents of the supercrystals. Then when we look at the 
PL coming out from uh, individual supercrystal, we see something like this. This is uh, this changes from supercrystal to supercrystal, but effectively it, it looks always very similar. You see some residual luminescence at the original quantum dot emission, but then you see a new peak emerging, and this new peak actually has a small substructure also. The energy shift here is depends on the composition so if you lose, use bromide chloride it's a little bit different from uh, um, bromide only uh, halide nanocrystals but it's on the order of 60 to 100 milli electron volt so this is much larger than actually what you would expect for trions or multi excitons so this this is more or less excluded as an explanation for this peak so this has to be something different and also it's this peak here is also observed in absorption so um, what we um, pro propose suggest more or less an interpretation, what we are actually seeing here is that this peak here is coming from uncoupled quantum dots that are still present there. And this peak here is coming from coupled quantum dots that are more or less nicely assembled and thereby form a new state like in molecular aggregates, for example, also in J aggregates or so, or in, in also in non-coherent aggregates, you see this, this red shift here. And actually, we see that the substructure here varies from uh, super lattice to super lattice. So uh, there we assume that this is due to different uh, superfluorescent domains and that are in within this one single super lattice. So what happens now when we're looking for this enhanced radiative decay in the system? So when we excite the system, with uh, uh, just looking at the decay times of these two different um, uh, peaks, more or less this uncoupled peak that we always have, let's say, as a reference. And then from this red shifted peak from the, from the coupled atoms, we see that the coupled here has a very non-exponential uh, curve and has become very fast. But actually, we also see that this, this, this behavior is very uh, powered, uh, strongly power dependent. So this means that very low excitation power, actually this red peak decays about with the same time constant as the uncoupled ones. So this in the, in the view of uh, superfluorescence, also you can imagine when you excite not so many dipoles, there are not so many to couple, so there's no, no superfluorescent effect that's happening. And actually, one can uh, speculate if this strange shape and this, this crossing here between the uh, radiative decay of the uncoupled ones and the coupled ones more or less also could uh, be a signature of this transition of between super radiance to sub radiance that's actually expected to, to occur in, in such systems over time, so at, at longer decay times. <clears throat> so. Of course, when you're doing experiments with uh, high power, power dependent, you're interested more or less, how's the power dependence? Because it could also be that it shows lazy or ASE or so is happening because you can imagine that uh, these this, uh, assemblies, they are not perfect, but they, you could think that they, they be a nice photonic resonators actually also what's happening. So what we did is making power dependent measurements where we looked at the intensity of superfluorescence peak and this quantum dot peak. And actually, when you measure over seven orders of magnitude and just plot the intensity here in a log log plot where you, uh, the lines are power law fits, you see that more or less no threshold is, is really observed. And uh, we also see that there's no significant quenching. So at the highest power, more or less here, it's, it's leveling off a bit for the uncoupled one. So there is then some slight quenching occurring. But in the end, this is uh, no, no, this no threshold tells you more or less that this is probably not like a lasing process that, that we're observing here. So um, this superfluorescent state, of course, it uh, has some special properties. So uh, as I told you, it's, it's, there should be some coherence that is uh, enhanced there. And actually, um, how we measure coherence, of course, is using a Michelson interferometer that uh, we also have from our polariton experiments, actually. And uh, with this, you can look at the coherence time coming from this blue peak from these uncoupled ones, and then from the red peak from the, from, the, from the coupled ones. And there you find that there's here some significant difference, but uh, here this uh, long decay from this red peak is actually not as long as we would have expected there. But uh, actually when you think about it really is that when you have several superfluorescent domains inside there, they will uh, emit also um, independently from each other. So this is why more or less they will destroy the coherence of this, this perfect, if you would have just one superfluorescent domain, you would expect 
a coherence time of on the order of the decay time, but this is shortened uh, as we think is because we have several superfluorescent domains in the system. Another uh, important feature, of course, uh, another kind of statistics that you can do is uh, looking for the emission uh, really on a single photon level using a Hanbury Brown twist setup. So I showed you before that if you use a single quantum dots, you get single photons, you get unbunching. So what happens now when you use a supercrystal there as, as a source and then you put it in the beam splitter and then you measure the coincidences there? Actually, what you will observe is that you will see bunching and actually this is what we are observing in the system is that this this blue emission peak the uncoupled ones they don't show any bunching and this red peak here which is uh, coming from the superfluorescence is uh, showing bunching and this is actually very also as as the coherence itself very much dependent on the on the super lattice on the individual super lattice where we're looking at so there are some super lattices where you see really the super bunching shooting up to a G2 of, of, of larger than two or, or, or three even. And um, then this, this, this we really attribute to this emission of, of photon bundles that is coming in the superfluorescent state. So um, going really to this very strong excitation regime. So when we, when we really pump hard, can we see these oscillations? And what you see here is this uh, street camera image where you see uh, the time is the vertical axis and on the horizontal is more or less the spectrum. So here you see the evolution of the emission spectrum over time. Time resolution here is street camera is about two picoseconds. And what you see is that there's one feature is a dynamical uh, energy shift over time. So it comes from the red side here and then it blue shifts. The original quantum dot emission would be for this compound here at, at this, this wavelength here approximately. And what you also see is that there are some pronounced oscillations in the decay. So this is exactly when you make then cuts uh, through this, this figure here, you can make it a little bit more quantitatively, you can fit the oscillation. And then you see that actually the decay time versus excitation density behaves as you would expect from uh, superfluorescence. You see that the peak intensity here at, at time zero also increases super linearly. I told you in principle, you would expect the exponent of two because it should scale as uh, n to the power of two, but we see only n to the power of 1.3. So uh, they're probably, this probably due because we still have many uncoupled uh, quantum dots in the system that are uh, in the street camera, we cannot uh, distinguish anymore because of the uh, low spectral resolution. And then if you look here at the decay time, you see that also the curves to shift more and more to the left with power and also this, uh, this this delay time it scales as you would expect for superfluorescence so the delay when the superfluorescent pulse comes out becomes shorter and shorter with higher excitation density of course it's important to do also control measurement so you take the very same quantum dots you put it for example in an inert matrix where they have enough distance that you're sure that they, they don't couple and then what you see is uh, this three camera image here actually here the time scale has been already in, in, enlarged because it's decaying so slow here on the right side you see the comparison so the red here is the superfluorescent curve and the blue here is from this uh, dispersed uh, quantum dots in, in polystyrene. And there more or less you see that there's no dynamical redshift and there's no ringing and, and no significant speed up even at this high power. So this tells you that all these things has to be like a multi-particle effect and cannot be really originating from a single particle. So moving on, now I showed you uh, that these uh, assemblies can be superfluorescence. Actually, some people said, ah, look, when you make these assemblies, they, over time, they start to merge these quantum dots, and so they can form like pieces of, of bulk. So then our chemistry friends at, at ETH, they came up with a new way, more or less, to make them more robust. And this is by attaching Twitter ion ligands instead of the uh, normal oleamine, uh, what, they, what they have. And this makes them more robust against aging and sintering. And also this makes enables you to use also smaller quantum dots with uh, which we're not able to uh, make stable um, super lattices with larger nanocrystals. Downside of this new method is that they are not monodisperse 
uh, in the same on the same level as as with the old synthesis method. So they had to uh, kind of add a um, refining step there where they use that they cycle it and they have some size selective precipitation where at the end they can still get to very mono dispersed samples, but they have to add additional steps. But if you do this, then you see more or less the same things here. This is now for compound where uh, the energy shift is not as large. You, you don't see it very well resolved is these two peaks. So this is again the uncoupled quantum dots. This is the coupled ones. And then here, just to separate it, if you look here for bulk like emission, this would be here. So here, I think for these ones, you can be really sure no, this is not centered to bulk. So this is really like still individual dots, but still individual dots, it still shows the very same signature as for the, as with the experiments that I have just shown you before. So you see when you increase the intensity there in the time domain, you see that they become continuously faster and faster and develop this ringing. And also the dependencies are as you would expect uh, for superfluorescence. Moving forward. So this, what I just showed you were, uh, let's say, simple nano um, uh, um, super lattice that, that are there. So they inherited the cubic symmetry of the individual nanocrystals. But actually, you can go further because this is, of course, interesting when you think about what happens when you arrange atoms in different ways. For example, if you use carbon, you do it amorphous, you can have, use it as a filter for sewage water. If you arrange it in layers, have graphene, you can put it on a pencil. Or if you arrange it in diamond-like lattice, you get nice and shiny diamonds. So this means in the end, structure really determines the properties and function of, of the system. So with, with the nanocrystals, the, the state of the art was, was not really there. So uh, people have done, for example, with spherical nanocrystals, they have done big spheres, or what's with cubic ones, they assembled this, this uh, super cubes as, as I have just shown you with this perovskite. But the question is, is it possible really to engineer also with these perovskite nanocrystals, more complex lattice structures. <clears throat> and there, uh, actually, it is. And what you have to do there is you uh, make a co-assembly of different types of nanocrystals there. So what you see here on the left is uh, simulation data, which shows you more or less when you change the effective size ratio between these spherical filler quantum dots and this uh, cubic perovskite nanoquantum dots, you can tune the uh, phases that are realized and when, when they assemble. And also what you have to vary is the packing density. And this can be varied by changing the ligands that you put in the system. So more or less you can make them more spacious or uh, also change the shape of, the, of this filler uh, nanocrystals which are inert, so they're optically transparent, so that they're, they're inert. And then more or less what is resulting there that you can really realize more complex phase, for example, this ABO3 refers to a perovskite type lattice made out of perovskite nanocrystals in the end. So if you look here at the positions of these perovskite nanocrystals, they have the same arrangement as an, an, an in an atomic um, perovskite lattice. And you can also realize like sodium chloride type structures. Effectively, when you have always the right conditions and the uh, busy PhD students doing a lot of tedious work to find the right conditions there, you can find that they, you can really assemble these things in this perovskite lattice. So what you see here on the right is a TEM uh, uh, movie that you see here with to tomography, which is cutting through a perovskite type uh, super lattice. So um, what can you do with this? Of course, in the end, we, you want to, to control with this kind of lattices, the superfluorescence that we see in the system. We want to engineer. So what you see here is the curve at, um, in the time domain, again, the, the, um, the luminescence for a power series when we change the laser power, where uh, we saw before this, the superfluorescence. But now we use the very same optically active nanocrystal but we use different fillers and different, and thereby realize different lattice structures. And actually there you can also see that you can change really the strength of the superfluorescence that you see in the system just by tuning the, the, the crystal lattice. <clears throat> you can take this to the next level, of course, the, the chemists, they are they're very busy and, and enjoying 
they're exploring all the possibility that you get there. So it's not only possible to use binary compounds, but you can also use ternary compounds where you mix three kinds of uh, quantum dots uh, together. You can realize with this low dimensional systems here, you see some columnar structures there. And in the end, of course, you can engineer this collective coupling in, in really tremendous ways. And then of course you can think about really many fundamental uh, nice experiments that you can do with this but of course for us we are of course very much interested to really uh, realize this, this strong light matter interacting materials in the end of course also seeing uh, like strong exciton exciton interaction which is still an open question in this system I explained to you that some uh, critics have uh, mentioned that maybe we are looking at bulk uh, material because these quantum dots in the super lattices merge. So as I told you, with this uh, new synthesis method, we, we were very sure that they don't merge, that they're really individual dots and they still sh show super fluorescence. So, but now what is it really when you would explicitly try to realize bulk-like uh, perovskite nanocrystal uh, uh, material system? And then of course, when you look in the literature, it's not forbidden that uh, such systems could not show um, excitonic super, super radiance there because in the end also like in solids you can see in continuous system you can uh, see uh, excitonic super fluorescence so the way uh, that uh, we approach this is that we are uh, going from the intermediate confinement regime which is uh, which i showed you before is to the weak confinement regime so this is done with a different synthesis method so called larblick and assisted precipitation where you get nanocrystal sizes on the order of several tens to up to hundreds of, of nanometers as you see in the um, picture on the right so what happens now when you cool these nanocrystals down to six kelvin and uh, look at the spectrum so you see the emission actually where at the wavelength where you expect the, the bulk uh, to emit so this is near 40 nanometer for this this compound and here when you increase the intensity you see that it's rather boring intensity here it's in log log uh, uh, log log plot where you see the exponent of 0 0.87 so there's even a small quenching so there's, there's no uh, nothing like a threshold also happening there. But actually, when you look in the time domain there, you, you see that actually the same things are uh, happening is uh, that that you see this super fluorescence so, um, speed up and this, this oscillation that are occurring. So this means also in this con more continuous system, we see this uh, key, this we see the key signatures of super fluorescence. So this answers more or less the question, is the super fluorescence also in, in more bulk? So even if they would have merged, we uh, would have still observed similar signatures. Next question is, what about temperature? So this is always a question that we get. We did all our experiments up to now at, at 6 Kelvin. So how long does it last when you, when you uh, warm them up? Uh, can you have super fluorescence at room temperature? And actually, <clears throat> when we published our, our paper about the super fluorescence, uh, some theorists uh, calculated then, then in that actually in our system, it seems like the thermal decoherence actually limits uh, the speed up that we observe in the system. We only see a speed up of a factor 28. But in principle, when you would think these assemblies, they consist of even like up to millions of, of quantum dots, you would expect a much larger uh, super radiant effect there. So they explained this with thermal decoherence. And actually, there's a very uh, basic relationship where you can think about when you would uh, um, expect super fluorescence is that this, this uh, geometric average of this delay time and the, radi and the super fluorescence decay time should be faster than the T2 time of the individual um, quantum dots that are in the system. So handwavingly, it's easy to understand. So if they are not coherent anymore, they will not couple. And then if if you have not this coherent coupling mechanism through this electromagnetic vacuum um, modes of the electromagnetic fields, you have to do it differently. And then what's happening is that you get so-called amplified spontaneous emission ASE if this condition is, is not fulfilled. So people have done these experiments in, in the past in, in the 80s actually has been done with these, these color centers in, in KCL, and there they, they could nicely show here this, this crossover between the super fluorescence regime and the ASE. So what to expect for our quantum dots there is uh, when we look at this forward mixing data that we have over temperature also there we see actually that this T2 time is going to change tremendously uh, with, with temperature. 
So then, of course, it's straightforward to do the experiment uh, there. Now we did this experiment with the lab, so this is not like the individual quantum plot. So this is like this this larger giant nanocrystals there, and there what you see is at low temperature, as I showed you before. This is where you see the superfluorescence oscillation. You warm up 65 Kelvin. You see that it becomes more gradual, and then at uh, above 100 K. More or less, you see that up to a certain excitation power, you see nothing, and then suddenly it, it shoots up. And then actually, you can make this uh, a little bit more quantitative. You look here at also the peak intensity here. You see that for these two, more or less, it scales about uh, approximately uh, linear or uh, not really linear with exponent of, of 1.5, as I showed before. Um, where we had this 1.3, which is like this, this superfluorescent increase, but in at high temperature there's at some point there's a kink here where more or less the intensity really explodes and this is what we interpret as really like ase is kicking in because then suddenly you have the sudden threshold with the super fluorescent system we always had this this continuous uh, speed up that we observe when we increase the power but now more or less we have just from more or less from one power setting to the other you see this this peak shooting up and uh, this is, you don't see any ringing or, or build up, up happening there. So this is why we interpret this with, uh, this is ASE. And then on top of this, now these are larger films of these giant nanocrystals. When we look, do these experiments for single individual nano uh, supercrystals that I showed you before, we never saw such behavior. So what you see there is that the superfluorescence just dies out, more or less becomes slower and slower. And then in the end, it vanishes at about 100 K. Because there in these systems, you don't have ASE, you have these individual um, um, supercrystals, and you don't have these films which are necessary to have amplified spontaneous emission, like we have now in this system. So to conclude, so I showed you our experiments where we uh, observed superfluorescence in the supercrystals. We saw up to 28 times uh, enhanced uh, radiative decay rate. I showed that we see these um, um, signatures of superfluorescence. Also, we see them in these Twitter ion uh, ligand assemblies there, which are more robust. And that you can really engineer also the superfluorescence by changing these this lattices. And finally, I, I, I finished here with this, this. This is not actually a property of this uh, discrete system, but also in continuous more bulk-like system. Also, you see the superfluorescence, and actually there we studied the transition to amplified spontaneous emission. So with this, I want to acknowledge here our partners at ETH and, and EMPAS, and uh, of course, all the collaborators in the papers that, that I showed you, and all these this funding agencies where we get money for our students from, and then in the end, also, of course, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Thilo, for this very nice, very nice talk. Uh, with wonderful results, actually. So, uh, guys, if you have questions, please raise your hand, uh, and then I will try to manage the incoming of questions. I will start myself until I see hands coming up uh, with uh, a question regarding the exit on binding energy. So you are talking now to a group of people uh, that uh, are working in polaritonics. We want to put uh, perovskites into our micro cavities. So what are the exton binding energies of these materials that you have been dealing with uh, in the supercrystal form? Uh, typically, they have at least several tens of milli electron volt. Uh, typically, it's more than 100, actually, what they have. It's, but of course, it's also within a quantum dot. There. So, I mean, in this quantum dot environment, of course, the exciton, they, it cannot delocalize much because it's also confined by, by the quantum dot itself. So, I think this exciton binding energy, of course, is more in this continuous system. I think this, this is where it becomes an issue, but it, it's large enough that it survives nicely at room temperature. Okay. And then when you went from, uh, just to complete this question before we take questions from, from the audience. So when you are working in the intermediate regime and you did some power dependencies, at no point you saw uh, any spectroscopic evidence of uh, the appearance of bi-excitons, for example. Why, 
why can't you get the, so how does the anti bunching that you see on the single crystals you know uh, play with the uh, with the excitation density do you go from an exciton regime to a bi exciton regime do you have ozeri combination in these systems etc excellent question actually so what you see is that at room temperature this anti bunching peak at zero time really goes down to zero so this means uh, these multi exciton excitations that are normally causing this residual peak at the time zero they're much suppressed at room temperature, probably because some thermally activated or also becomes more efficient than at low temperature. Mm -hmm. At low temperature, actually, it's very interesting why we don't observe this, this uh, by exciton. So what we see very much is this trion, what is attributed to this trion, which has an energy shift on the order of 15 to 20 MeV. But actually, we, we never saw something which has, let's say, the power law of two, as you would expect from a bi -exiton. So only very recently, actually, with uh, new material systems uh, that we uh, did with, together with, there with ETH, the study, there we now started to observe also the bi at uh, between 20 and 30 MeV uh, energy there. But uh, actually, we don't know why we don't observe really single uh, single individual bi exciton peaks there. Actually, when you increase the powers, I don't have the data there of a single quantum dot, it becomes very messy. So I showed you just a low excitation regime where you see one line. When you increase the intensity, you get more trions, you get two lines. If you increase more, you get 10 lines. And uh, suddenly all different kinds of things start to happen because you start to charge the quantum dot and this of course stresses also the exciton state and leads to energy shift so this uh, a lot of things uh, happen there and i think it, there's still a lot to be understood actually with, with this perovskite nano crystal okay thank you Tilo. so uh, we have uh, a question from uh, surendra please go ahead hi Tilo. um <laughs> uh, my question is about thank you for a very interesting talk it's always like i'm learning more from your uh, studies in perovskite nanocrystals and uh, what I was wondering is like um, if you have the super lattices and from your power dependent studies do you see any sublinearity because of exciton exciton annihilation uh, compared to individual quantum dots like similar to what people do with monomers and J aggregates so similar like that uh, is there anything to or will you suggest that there is a longer exciton diffusion length uh. in I mean, I showed you that this this one graph over this seven yeah. orders magnitude there. So mm -hmm. in this sense, I would say it seems to be more robust uh, against exciton exciton interaction, probably because the excitons are decaying so much faster there. Because if you're in the mm -hmm. super radiant regime, of course, they don't need to live hundreds of picoseconds because after 10 picoseconds, all the light, all the excitation is, has gone out. Okay. So maybe this, this, this can help there. And uh, so in, in this sense, I cannot really comment more than, than this actually on, on this. Okay, okay. Or uh, anything on like this meta structures which is coming in your next studies, like slowly moving these excitonic systems far apart or controlling the distance between them, will that give some more um, uh, clues on like there is an exciton exciton annihilation possibility or something? Yeah, yeah. I know it's a bit. Yes, probably. Uh, I mean, there, there are probably many studies that you can do. And actually, also now our ETH friends, they started to make these co-assemblies also with uh, several kinds of quantum dots there, and, uh, several kinds of perovskite quantum dots, so active quantum dots where you can maybe see different couplings that are might occur there. So there, mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that, that will be interesting now that this new playing field is open. But of course, yeah. the field is vast where you can do experiments. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shurendra. Uh, Tamsin. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, on this uh, super lattice, uh, I think you're on the, the right section now. Is this all these dynamics, are they from a single cuboid super lattice? Or are they from several bulk ones together? So, uh, this here, for example, is, is coming from really from a single uh, super lattice, but actually the street camera uh, data that I showed you, so this is all, always a single ones, this is still single ones, but this data for the street camera, we needed to have more super lattices there. So just because of the signal that one super lattice was not, not enough and uh, more or less they're, they're both uh, there. So a, a mixed kind of uh, single super lattice data with multi super lattice data. 
But here the super lattice is they're spaced several microns apart, so you don't expect that they show any coupling. That leads to my second question was how close can you put two super lattices for them to couple in and show us some effects in the coupling in either these time dynamics or in the decays or. Uh... Yeah. So I, I mean, you, you have to distinguish, I think, two effects there. So here you see on the left, you see this uh, a microscopy picture, which gives you about the uh, hint about the, the length scales there. So you see that some of them, they start to merge. Some of them, they're really isolated. So with this, this density, you, you can play there. And actually, this experiment that I showed you in the second part, where they engineered this binary super lattice with this filler uh, things, they are not individual super lattices like here anymore, but they're continuous layers. And in this layer, more or less, they realized this perovskite type crystal structure out of perovskite nanocrystals. So there they're not isolated anymore, uh, but uh, they're, they're complete layers. But this depends more or less, I think, on the end of the, on the density and, and the conditions that you have for this uh, drying mediated self assembly, then, then you can tune. And I think for these binary super lattices and ternary super lattices, it's much more difficult to get to this regime. They have succeeded now to, to also go to this isolated uh, super lattice, like you see here on, on, on the left like with this cubic system, but I think it's more difficult than, uh, than with this, uh, than to, to get this, these films there. Um, and a third question, if it's okay to ask another, is uh, when you were measuring the coherence of these super lattices, um, I, yeah, I can't remember the slide, I'm very sorry. This one first order. Um, yeah, so this was, so the top is the, sorry, could you remember, remind me which, the, t the top is the uncoupled. Yes, so this is the uncoupled one and this is the coupled one. So just uh, using a, a spectral filter more or less, once we put uh, this onto the camera and once we put this peak onto the camera and then we change the time delay between these two arms of the interferometer. This is what you're seeing. Then we analyze the fringe amplitude that you see here. So this is really now a single super lattice. And then we analyze the fringe amplitude versus uh, time. What I was wondering is, uh, was there any size dependence to your super lattice in terms of uh, increasing or decreasing the uh, the the lifetime from 140 picosecond in the coupled dots. So if you had a bigger super lattice, if you chose and did the same measurement, would it be the same or longer or shorter? Or yeah, so in principle, uh, you would expect a big effect actually when you change the size of the super lattices. But actually, what I told you is that we have already millions of of uh, quantum dots there. And we still only see a speed up of effect of 28. So we don't see more or less that all the million quantum dots they couple, but only a, sm a smaller part of them uh, couple actually. So this, uh, in the end, you can say like 28 of these quantum dots, they're coupling on average if you do these experiments with it, it this excitation power. So in this sense, I think if you would be able to size these super lattices on the order of several tens or so quantum dots this would be very interesting to see if you can really uh, tune this interaction uh, this 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 uh, superfluorescent eff effect there but at the moment where we are we see a mixture of superfluorescent domains in in our sample and so we think also this is a reason why we see not uh, like picosecond time uh, coherence but we are really down to this femtosecond because more or less we see, you mix in these experiments of course the light coming from several domains which are contained in this million quantum dots that, that form one super lattice. Thank you very much. Okay, Stepan from Skull Technik. Uh, hello, Tilo. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, my question is uh, uh, sort of similar to the time scenes. I'm wondering uh, what parameters do affect uh, the photon number fluctuation from this system. Uh, you said that uh, uh, you observe a bunching in G2 function and uh, also some of the uh, works show the super bunching like above two value at zero time delay. So what uh, kind of uh, pump parameters or uh, like maybe uh, lattice parameters do affect this uh, high photon number fluctuation if you know? So, so actually, uh, what you see 
here is that there's the substructure in the superfluorescent peak. And then actually what we observed is then when you don't have so much substructure, more or less when you have only one or two dominant then, then peaks, they ideally just one, you see the super bunching here uh, going really shooting up. So what we uh, think is happening is that in these cases where you see only this very mild super bunching, let's say G2 of 1.1 or so, uh, this very mild bunching there, this is what you see, uh, what you get is when you have several super fluorescent domains that are there. And then of course, there's no uh, coherent state that is, uh, or uh, let's say they're, they're not synchronized these, these, these different domains that they emit in a, um, in a coherent way, these, these, these photon bundles. And this only happens when you see one dominating domain. We see the super bunching here really above three. If you see some substructure here, several peaks, you, it's reduced. And actually, this is really very significantly from super lattice to super lattice. So they're, they're, they're very nice ones, and they're more or less ones where this G2 is almost flat, where you don't see any bunching at all. Uh, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I have a question ah, from Dimitri. We have a question from Southampton. Dimitri? Thank you, Tilo, for a great talk. Um, I was wondering if, um, what do you think about the possibility of this uh, uh, super lattice uh, crystal, super crystal, to act as a cavity itself? So, like, and inherit the cavity properties in this micro. Because there was a work I believe last year uh, when um, such modes was observed in a micro cuboid a little bit larger than your one, but it was in at room temperatures and uh, they observed some polaritonic and uh, excitonic lasing from. Uh, yeah, so I, I also noticed this work, actually, I think that there was one also nature for uh, nature uh, com, I think, where they looked also at the transition more or less between this more or less like super fluorescent regime and then lasing regime or how you would call it, and when you really see the cavity mode. So what we saw in our system is we never had any signatures of, let's say, some discrete, nice cavity modes that, that we observed there. I mean, I mean in, in, they, in their system, I think they always see this kind of regular spacing even there, which then when they increase the intensity, it shoots up. We, we never observed something like this. So, I mean, one can speculate that maybe the optical quality for uh, making real a cavity for our quantum plots is not as nice as, as theirs because you saw in this uh, SEM picture that they're slightly cuboidal. They have actually some quite uh, some pillow shape. And so, so they, they're not perfect. So maybe theirs are, are more perfect than ours. Thank you. Anton uh, Zestedatilev. <clears throat> Hello, Tilo. Thanks. Great talk. Um, I have a follow-up question for, for Stefan Swan. Um, the, the decay of the G2 uh, measurements we can see here, do you think it is related to, um, to the resolution limit of your setup or it's really some sort of second order coherence time or so? No, I mean, what you see here is actually it's not even, uh, done in pulse experiments, it's in CW. And uh, oh, okay. so the resolution of our setup is about 50 picosecond and the decay time here is actually about the order of the fluorescence decay of this uh, system. Mm -hmm. So which is on the order of a few hundred uh, picosecond there. So this is why um, we relate this to, to this time. Why this has yeah, this well. time, I cannot tell you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, in principle, you would expect that it should be decaying much faster, but here these are, let's say, very weak um, excitation. It's CW excitation. So we for mm -hmm. sure are not in a regime where we have this 20 effect of 28 speed up. So you, you wouldn't expect that it's really much faster mm -hmm. than this, but still even in this very low excitation regime, <clears throat> this, this, this bunching effect happening. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm not really familiar with uh, the super radiance of uh, in, in, in details, but um, what kind of uh, the dependence of second order coherence you expect uh, with the number of emitters coupled together? How does it scale the, the, the coherence time, second order coherence time, how does it scale with the, with the number of emitters you couple? 
So in principle, you expect that the decay scales with a number n. So it's um, like um, n times the intensity means n times faster decay. So this you expect a linear dependence of the decay time in the ideal okay. gradient. And this of okay. course means that in the end, your coherence time will get shorter and shorter because your pulse will be emitted faster and faster. Isn't it uh, related to the first the first third of coherence time, but not to the second one, isn't it? I mean, because for for instance, for the for the coherence for the coherent uh, source, the with the number of let's say photons in a mode, the first order coherence rises, but the second order coherence drops. Uh, but in case of this super radiance, what would you expect? Um, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly there. I mean, the first and second of the coherence are not the same, right? I mean, the, the, the coherence time are not the same. Definitely. They're different, yeah. But, but I mean, here you, you cannot get a correlation when more or less no photon is emitted anymore. So I see a hard uh, time. I understand, yeah. in, if, the, if the decay has happened, it will be dark material. So no photon can come out at a longer time there. Yeah. I, I think in the ideal case, you would expect that it's Fourier limited, what you by, see. By the width of your the pulse, right, basically. Yeah. And then, of course, this scales with the intensity or with okay. the number of, of uh, things and becomes faster and faster. Uh -huh. so. I see. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Anton. So, Tilo, I have a question which um, uh, has to do with uh, with the with the energy shift that you see for the superfluorescent peak. So, you said that you described very nicely that uh, similar to what happens to J aggregates, you would expect to get a red shift. But of course, depending on how your dipole align, you could go into the regime of the H aggregates where you would get a blue shift. Now, when you play with a different type of lattices. Have you ever observed an arrangement that actually would give you, instead of a red shift for the superfluorescent emission, to get a blue shifted superfluorescent emission? So in principle, then the H aggregate should be actually be subradiant, then so it should not be enhanced. But still, actually, what we observed, what I, I but I think I don't have data on this in my backup slides there, but it's in in the supporting information of our nature is that we observed blue superfluorescence on some of the crystal um, structures, but this is not very much blue. So it's almost resonant with the exciton. And what we think is happening there is that you have this disordering effect through the super lattice, but still, let's say you have this ex pure excitonic super radiance that can happen. So it does not come from this coupled state, but it comes, let's say from the guys that would be normally uncoupled in the system. But then when you excite them strong enough, you can see the superfluorescence at, uh, at, uh, um, at blue energies. And actually this only happens at about one order of magnitude higher excitation density than we observe here for the, for this uh, aggregates where you see on the right. But yes, of course, this is uh, with this kind of H aggregates, this is actually something that of course we have been looking for. We see some crystal lattices where we see peaks on the blue side, but there we don't see superfluorescence. But actually, we cannot be so sure because these kind of crystal lattices, they can only assemble on carbon grids. And so normally, this, this, what I showed you in the second half, they are not nice samples. So they are, they are typically done on TEM grids and or on membranes. So what we measured, the superfluorescence uh, was done on silicon nitride membranes. So they're very small windows, a few hundred micron size that they can make this, but they cannot make it on nice samples. And actually some of the lattices, they cannot even make on this transparent material, but they can make it only on carbon or copper grids. And then of course, what we also observed is actually when you have the very same super lattice and you put, make, put it on a different substrate like this carbon or this, this copper, you don't see any superfluorescence coupling. Also when you, in this binary super lattices, when you wouldn't use transparent materials. So what I showed you is now experiments with sodium gadolinium fluoride nanocrystals as fillers. These, they are nicely transparent. But for example, if you use like iron oxide, they can do fantastic nice lattices with this nice shapes, but the iron oxide is absorbing. So we never observe superfluorescence in, in these uh, samples there. So it just means for the superfluorescence there, you're very limited more or less what you can do in the engineering there. I mean, they're, they're advancing the chemistry more and more. So um, 
that let's hope that they uh, can really make everything on nicely optically suitable uh, substrates where you can do this kind of experiments. Thank you. We have a question from Jacek. Good morning, Jacek. Hi, uh, Jacek, you're on mute. Jacek, we cannot hear you. Your microphone is muted. Okay. Now we can hear you, Jacek. Hello. Go ahead. For, for, for a very nice uh, presentation. Um, I, I have a question concerning the polarization of light emitted from this uh, cubic structures. This is probably linear. And so if you if you think about the uh, the ordering of dipoles between different uh, nanocrystals, do you think that uh, the, 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 the making the super lattice allowed also for alignment of the style dipoles due to the alignment of uh, the, 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 the polarization? Is it, is it the issue in the su super radiance? Uh... Actually, uh, this also what we expected that we would observe linear polarization. Actually, what we observe is no polarization. And we believe this comes from the fact that in the end, we never have a single super fluorescent domain. So we always have many super fluorescent domains, which of course can synchronize and, and emit in a different way. These um, quantum dots that uh, I, I showed you, I, I didn't show you these, these single dot experiments. They have actually a fine structure, which has like three orthogonal uh, so-called bright triplet state there, which has like um, uh, emissive states in all um, directions, so to say. So the quantum dots, dots themselves, they're more or less therefore able to emit in a rather unpolarized way. I mean, the individual quantum dots are nicely polarized with this fine structure, but if you look at the ensemble, more or less, you see them rather unpolarized there. So uh, with the polarization, there's you're completely right. You would expect that it's like nicely linear polarized because you expect this emission coming from a single coherent state, but actually we were surprised not to find it. But for us, we, we, we were thinking that, yes, of course, if you have many of these domains inside one of these super lattices, they will not more or less uh, in the end end up with one single polarization. So a follow-up question from uh, Anton. Yeah, uh, just um, a bit different question uh, from the perspective. Uh, do you think, is it feasible to get electrically driven perovskite laser, is it? Uh, a perovskite laser, you mean on this, this uh, super lattices or in I general? I mean, if it's helpful, it would be great. Yeah, I think yeah. in general, yes. I think if you have uh, this, this small uh, bulk-like stuff and it, it works nicely, as, as, we, as we saw, then of course you can think maybe put some electrodes there and then check the curves there. I'm I'm not an expert. I mean there there are really people doing this this LEDs on with perovskite there. So I, I I cannot really make a qualified statement there. Okay, I have a follow up question from uh, Jacek's question because uh, I, I mean I understand and it's very clear that you know you have different domains in these very large crystals. When you did the anti-bunching measurements, if you polarization filter the emission before you bring it on your HBT setup, do you see an increase of the anti-bunching? Because by polarization filtering, now you select a sub-sample of the domains within which you may have this kind of coherent coupling and superfluorescence. Actually, it's a good suggestion. I think we, we, we never did. So, I mean, I think you can think about if you use a monochromator also to filter more spectrally that you get reduced the number of domains that you have there. Because normally what we do is we have like a bandpass filter, which has like several nanometers of, of bandwidth. And then we tune this that that is only the red band there. But of course you get everything there. But I think polarization, no, I think I don't think that, that we ever tried, but good idea. Okay. And then uh, I something which uh, came to me from the beginning. So you showed the method in which uh, these uh, super crystals are formed. And uh, this method, uh, practically depending on how, for how long you let your, how much solvent you have in order to, to, to enable this precipitation, uh, this, uh, uh, this transition from the individual uh, dots to super crystals, you can control somehow the size of the super crystal, yes? 
Yes and no. So more or less, if you have like one sample there, I mean, you saw this distribution of sizes in this microscopy picture. Actually, this is just from one area of the sample. So mm -hmm. when you go, for example, towards the edge or so, you see that the sizes, they really vary and also the density varies. So it's not like you get a homogeneous density over and size distribution over the whole sample. No, it, it varies over if you have a piece of one by one centimeter, it varies. Right, but are there then ways to separate the different sizes? Yes, in I think you described one of the ways that they can separate the different sizes so that you can really go to very small sizes. You don't need millions of these kind of dots together. You just need a few hundred, yes, max. So can you uh, post-growth selectively uh, choose those which have just very few dots inside? Um, actually, we, we never tried hard because there's a certain distribution to it. So normally you have distribution of, I don't know, one to five micron, let, let's say like this, but one micron is still huge. So one micron is still like hundreds of thousands of uh, quantum dots if you make it really like a cubic volume. So it's not in a range where we are interested there, but actually there we are having now a, a new project with, together with ETH where we are really trying to make size controlled and also smaller um, supercrystals there. But this, this requires, of course, additional structures that you put there in additional effort. Right. Thank you very much, Thilo. If there are no more questions from the audience, thank you very much for this great talk today. It is good to see you. Uh, we should talk about some other business. <laughs> so I will be calling you back on Skype after this. <laughs> I have another meeting actually. <laughs> so, you have another meeting starting. So if you can call me on Skype today anyway to talk okay. about uh, about Pollock. And uh, yes, thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, uh, enjoy the, the, the festive period coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Oh.